Bless the Lord all. You can, let's do that for Jesus. Let's stand up and give him. Lord, we just bless you. We give you glory, King of glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. We magnify your holy name this morning. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you so much for the privilege. The privilege to seek your face. Lord, we bless. Come on, let's pray for Pastor Troy. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this time of seeking your face. We thank you for this time of rest. We thank you for this time of, Lord, him receiving downloads from heaven for you for the next assignment. We also pray for refreshing and just joy and peace over his family. In Jesus' name, all God's people said Amen and amen. Well, I got my beautiful bride with me today. I don't think I had her with me last time. De Havilland, if you would stand up. It's my wife, De Havilland Ford. And if you follow her and what we do at 818 The Sign, especially the women's side of the things, uh, where she is a sign, she's one of my favorite preachers in America, all right? If you would, turn me in your Bibles to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 22, all right? That would be one of the deepest pockets ever. I felt like I was going, reaching off into China to go get my glasses. <laughs> Isaiah 22, look at verse 15. Now, I know Pastor Troy is a numbers person, and from time to time, I, that, I kind of fall into that thing. How many of y'all are like numbers people? Like, you, yeah. How many of y'all, you wake up at 222? Yeah. yeah, you see, the, yeah, you people are the culprits. I was going to preach on something else, and God took me right back to this scripture. I don't think I've ever preached this here. It's one of my life verses, but I feel like what we're going to talk about today are some of the great things that God did this year, but also what he's leading us into after bringing us through an Isaiah 22 year. So this is a prophetic house. I don't get to preach like this everywhere else. <laughs> so we're going to be prophets and just do what prophets do today. Amen. All right. So Isaiah 22, verse 15. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, come go to the steward to Shebna, who's in charge of the royal household. What right do you have here and whom do you have here that you have hewn a tomb for yourself here? You have hewn a tomb for yourself in the heights. You carve a resting place for yourself on the rock. Behold, the Lord is about to hurl you headlong, O man, and he's about to grasp you up firmly and roll you up tightly like a ball to be cast into a vast country. There you will die and there your splendid chariots will be, you shame of your master's house. Now how would you like to have that as a prophetic word to you. <laughs> I mean, he's about to get, I mean, he's going to the woodshed with, with God, isn't he? <laughs> God takes nations to woodsheds at times. <laughs> it takes me and you to the woodshed too. I've been there a couple of times. <laughs> And he says, I will depose you from your office. I will pull you down from your station. Verse 22, 20. Then it'll come back in that day. Everybody say that day. That I will summon my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. And I will clothe him with your tunic and I will tie your sash securely about him. I will trust him with your authority and he will become a father to an inhabitant of the house of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Verse 22, 22. Then I will set the key to the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one will open. And I will drive him like a peg at a firm place. And he become a throne of glory to his father's house. So they will hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, offspring and issue, all the least of vessels to the greater vessels from the bowls to the jars. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, the peg that was driven in a firm place will give way. It would even break down and fall. And the low hanging on it will be cut off. For the Lord has spoken. Today we're going to talk about the kid David and what I believe God is doing with Open Door this year. And moving into next year, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you are the one who holds the kid David, according to Revelation 3. And God, we thank you so much for opening the door to our hearts to receive you. In opening your heart to, for us to receive your kingdom. We thank you so much for kingdom authority, but more than, more than anything, kingdom intimacy. And we thank you for the influence that you're releasing through us in this hour, especially through Open Door here and in Houston and everywhere this, this ministry goes. God, I thank you for what you're doing with this house in this season and what you have in store for us today. In Jesus' name, when all God's people said, amen. amen and amen. So I love this scripture. Like I said, uh, 
uh, the Pastor Troy, I mean, has gone to a whole nother level with, I think, with the signs in terms of numbers. I, I've gone through a, a season of that in, in, my, in my own life. Uh, and it started first with this scripture here, Isaiah 22. And so it started off with uh, my, my spiritual pops, Dust Sheets. He was talking to me about how the Lord was giving him these series of confirmations that he was releasing great authority in his life. And he was giving him this number, 222. And it was related to Isaiah 22, 22, because there wasn't enough numbers on the clock or whatever. He would just wake up and see 222, go to sleep from naps or whatever, wake up at 222, get ready to speak. It'd be 222 when he get ready to speak in some conference in the middle of the day. But uh, one day, <clears throat> his spiritual pastor Sam Branfield gives him this prophetic word about Isaiah 22, 22, the key of authority that leaves from that encounter with him and goes into his uh, flight Gets to the gate, he's leaving out of gate 22. Does you love when God gives confirmations? <laughs> Leaves out of gate number 22. He was signed seat number 22. And then the flight attendant came on and said, well, this flight is gonna be two hours and 22 minutes. <laughs> so he knew that God was speaking to him about Isaiah 22, 22. When he got to the place he was gonna speak, somebody walked up to him, gave him three keys, said it was related to Isaiah 22, 22. They knew nothing about the prophetic swirl that he was in. How many of you get these crazy prophetic swirls? We get them. A lot of times because we're like asking for confirmation. Y'all ever played a confirmation game with God? Yeah, you know, you say, okay, God, if this is really you talking to me, and you make it like really hard with calculus and algebra and some other language, you know, mixed in or whatever. You're really you talking to me and, you know, you know, Gideon with the fleece, right? Put the fleece down, make the fleece wet, the ground dry, and then God did. He said, okay, let's switch it. We do that too, right? So, okay, God, this is really you. I need you to do this, this, and this like this. And then God goes, Phew. and he goes, ah. Okay, but if it's really you, and he starts all over, you start all over again. Don't you? <laughs> I kind of went through a season of that, of that with, with this. And God does those things. One, because it's fun. Yeah, he likes to have fun with stuff. He loves to bring signs because it makes us wonder and it takes us deeper into the wonder of his love. Yeah. All right? And so I went through a season there with this scripture, Isaiah 22. God just kept reminding me, listen, I'm releasing a new level of authority, of authority in your life. It's connected to the next generation. And releasing new doors that are going to open that no man can close and close doors no man can open in your own life. And so uh, one of the ways he confirmed this with me with this, was with the, uh, a niece of mine named Ayana. Lives here in the area. Uh, at the time, Ayana was going to George Washington University, Washington, D.C. And so... Um, Praying for her, because, you know, she's in a secular university, man, and just the way that, that, that place was pulling on her faith. So I, was, so I was praying for her, and sure enough, I got a call at 222, and I looked, and it was Ayana. She called me at 222 <laughs> from Washington. So I thought, well, well, let me invite her to this prayer gathering I'm doing with Lou Engle called the call New England. So I, I talked to her about it and said, hey, we're doing this prayer gathering in uh, New England. You needed to be there. It's 2001 at the time. And uh, I said, uh, let me see the date. And they all said, they changed the date to September 22nd. She said, oh, that's my birthday. I said, really, how old are you going to be? She said, yeah, 22. I said, well, now they, uh, <clears throat> I, I just bought a new Bible for you and some other things. Give me your address and let me send that to you. She said, well, I just moved off campus and now I live at 2222 I Street. I mean, this stuff gets crazy, right? And it was spelled E-Y-E because it has so many, like, alphabet name uh, streets in Washington, D.C. She lived at 2222 I Street. What was God saying? Oh, and she went to George Washington University. George Washington's birthday is what? February 22nd. Another 222. God is saying, I hadn't forgotten about what I promised your forefathers. Keep your eye out for this next generation because the accumulated prayers of previous generations are about to be downloaded in the generation. Pay for God's glory. When God starts moving like this, he'll put down one and raise up another. And that's what you see happening here in this scripture here in Isaiah 22. And that's what I feel like is about to happen here. Uncanny, ridiculous favor is going to be released on many people here. Uh, some of you guys are, uh, are moving into levels of government. 
city government, maybe even state legislators. I, I felt like God was raising up even, even uh, amongst the open door company, but also too in the marketplace, you're about to see greater influence being released. I'm going to explain to you a little bit more what that looks like. Policy changes, God is raising you up, and especially in a time of crisis, to be problem solvers to society. And that's what I see happening through open door this year. So so who's this person he's talking about pulling down? This guy he's pulling down, his name's Shebna. Shebna means tender shoot. Tender shoot. And so Shebna, his name literally means tender shoot in you know, Hebrew word pictures. His name represents like a blade of grass that's growing up that's not quite mature yet. So Shebna represents immature, unfathered authority. In other words, this is someone with an orphan spirit, and that's what you see right now God is dealing with. He's judging that orphan spirit right now that's having a whole generation struggling with identity issues from, from what gender am I to or everything else. God is putting his finger on that. He wants to bring healing to that. But that kind of person in leadership does way more damage. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, Oz Hillman, in his book, Change Age, it talks about how there were over 300 world leaders who were some of the worst tyrants, worst leaders ever in, the wor in world history, and all of them were orphans. From Hitler to Stalin and others, all, all of them were orphans. In other words, the rest of the world were recipients of their rage against their dads. Right? So when you don't have that thing healed inside of you, it brings great damage, especially in terms of leadership. So it, the, what we're about to see in this season is influence is about to shift in powerful ways. Influence is about to shift. Now, I thought I knew what influence was until I did a word study on the word influence. Just looking at the etymology of the word. I, thought I, I always thought of influence as a verb. Did you know that first and foremost, influence is a noun? Like as a person, place the thing first. All oh, the English teachers said Amen. <laughs> and the original definition for influence, y'all, it tripped me out. Here's the original definition. Influence. An ethereal fluid which flows from the stars and affects the actions and behaviors of mankind. Ethereal, meaning heavenly. So it could be said a heavenly fluid which flows from the stars which affects the actions and behaviors of mankind. It turns out that the word influence and influenza are cousin words. The word influenza used to be an ethereal fluid which flows from the stars, which carries out the star's desire to make mankind sick in mass. So any person that had epidemic popularity, epidemic fame, was said to have influence. When they didn't have words like pandemic and epidemic like we have today. Now today it means spiritual force or moral force which knowingly or unknowingly affects the actions and behaviors of others consciously or unconsciously. So it's not, if you're being influenced, it's what is influencing you, right? And so if influence comes from a star, well, there's, what, a third of the stars that fell with Satan? That occupy that second heaven level realm that, that uh, control the hearts, thoughts, minds of people? Second heaven level revelation? principalities and powers, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. But it's only a third of them that fell. That means there are at least two-thirds that war on our behalf. All right? And the truth of the matter is this. We have angelic stars that war on our behalf and that carry influence. You see this in Judges 5 and 20 when Deborah is singing our spontaneous prophetic song uh, about how to overthrow Sisera. She says this in Judges 5 and 20. She says this, from the heavens the stars fought. From their courses they warred against Sisera. Hold up, Deborah, what are you talking about? I thought Sisera was on the ground. What the stars have to do with his defeat? She's saying this, because I had favor with the bright morning star. He released this influence on my behalf. And his angelic stars, one of the war against Sisera's demonic fallen stars. And when I got breakthrough in the heavens, it was on the earth as it was in heaven because I had influence in the right place. Because when you stake yourself to God's promises in your prayer tent, God will use your intercession like a peg to annihilate the enemy's influence. And that's what you're about to see operate through open door. Here's, here's the thing. They're not just angelic stars that carry influence. God's people are stars that carry influence. Right? Genesis 15, 5, what did God say to Abraham? Abraham, look up at the stars and count them if you can. Then he said this, so shall your descendants be. He wasn't talking about the quantities 
of his descendants only. He was also talking about the quality of their essence. In other words, you're called to be a star. Daniel 12, 3 and 4, come on. Daniel 12, 3 and 4 says it like this. It says, the wise men in those days will shine as brightly as all the expanse of heaven. And those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. In other words, we're supposed to be cosmic traffic cops that lead people to the bright morning star, Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be that Matthew 2 and 9 star that shines brightly in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. We're supposed to be those that lead people like that bright morning star in Matthew 2 and 9, that, that bouncing ball that led the wise man to Christ. Yeah. That's us. So I started looking at that. I thought, hold up. These folks in Hollywood are not movie stars by the biblical definition then. Because they're either building their own kingdom, which is still the demonic kingdom. And then some of them, yeah, true enough, they know who they're working for, some of them. Balenciaga and a few others, they know who they're working for. So let's focus on movie stars. They're just celebrities. They're celebrities who have favor with fallen stars. They have favor with fallen principalities and powers. And their influence like the flu is making a whole generation sick. Right? I can give you, I can give you a couple of examples, but the thing is this. We have celebrities in the church too that operate under wrong influence. See, the thing about being a celebrity today it's all about being a good actor. And the word actor back in Jesus' day was the word hypocrite. That was literally the word for actor. So what the hypocrites would do, and you would see like the green actor, screen actor guild, like uh, mask or whatever, where they would take, you know, the smiling mask or the frowning mask. They would take these different masks. The actors in those days would take a different mask, several of them, because you only had like one or two uh, actors on the stage or hypocrites on the stage and so they would take the mask and portray one character put it down and portray another character put it down and portray another character right so if I was to talk about somebody today being an actor back then I, if I was to say well, man that Denzel Washington I wouldn't say he's a good actor I said man that Denzel he's a really good hypocrite isn't he it sounds weird doesn't it but that was the word for actor but that's what the church celebrity does they act one way at church they act another way with their friends. They have to act another way at work. But in private, they're a mess. And here's the thing. When how things look is what matters most in your life, how things are will never be dealt with. So there's a difference between being a celebrity and being a star, according to the biblical understanding. See, celebrities use people to support their authority. But stars, true biblical stars, use their authority to support people. They take their strengths and come underneath their weaknesses. Celebrities use their influence so they can be around the so-called somebodies of society. But true stars use their influence so they can empower the so-called nobodies of society. They hang out with children that have been orphaned by cartels and they pray for blind people in Mexico and see them get healed. They care about the least of these, right? Celebrities are initiated and humiliated in order to receive their humility and their influence. But true stars are discipled and they humble themselves. And at the right time, God exalts them. So the truth of the matter is this. You can either be a celebrity bound under the influence of the kingdom of darkness or you could be a star that rules and reigns with Christ in heavenly places. And that's what God is doing through Open Door this year. And the Shebnas are being dealt with. All around the world, we're going to see conflicts. I believe the conflict next year in Ukraine, in Russia, is going to be resolved. And God is addressing this, this whole Shebna thing. It's, it's interesting. Vladimir Putin has been there for 22 years. This is his 22nd year of his reign. I believe God is honestly giving him another chance to get right. But then also he's pulling this thing down. Not just with him, but all, across, all around the world. And uh, Ukraine is not in, too innocent in this thing too, but God is dealing with the nations of the earth. He's dealing with this one as well. And in the midst of great crisis, God is raising up you, Eliakim. So who is this Eliakim guy? Eliakim means set up by God and raised up by God. And the connotation is that of an awakening, like someone who's sleeping all of a sudden, phew, set up in their way, right? Sometimes that has to be the rude awakening for the, before the great awakening. And I believe that's the stage that we're in right now because we got to get you Eliakim's alert and in place 
and put into position. And that's what's happening here in this verse. He's the son of Hezekiah. It's interesting. God raises up somebody who's fathered and mentored. Listen, those who have been humbling themselves, those who've been uh, uh, seeking the Lord and have been mentored and fathered, those are the people that God is raising up in this hour. Why? Because they understand the importance of an inheritance and how to steward it. So he's raising up the son of Hilkiah. Hilkiah literally means inheritance. So he's raising up the sons of inheritance for an awakening. Right? Raising up the sons of inheritance for an awakening. Verse 21 says there's this shift that happens. Shebna's sash is given to Eliakim. The authority is given to Eliakim. And he's going to entrust Eliakim with what God's heart is for the next generation. Verse 22, 22. I set the key to the house of David on his shoulder, representing government authority. Listen, the deal is this. Who's ruling the shoulder the responsibility for the move of God in this generation? That's why God is raising up you to be the awakener in this hour, to steward the move of God for your family, for your community, and for the nations. Who's going to shoulder the responsibility? When he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one will open. And all that's really key. Verse 23 says this, I will drive him like a peg in a firm place, and he'll become a throne of glory to his father's house. That peg, y'all, is not just... Uh, any old, like a tent peg is a peg that's actually driven into the wall of a house and according to Freeman's Manners and Customs they will actually build that wall of the house up and around that peg to make sure it stays secure and intact all right so the peg stuck out from the house but it wasn't more important than the house because the house was important listen for those of you who are about to move into this season of favor with being pegged remember you're not more important than the house that's supporting you Humility would be very key to carrying the glory that God is about to release in this hour, all right? So, and then it says, so they were hanging on him, all the least of vessels from the greater vessels, from the bowls to the jars. Vessels represent what? People, right? So, on this peg, they're hanging vessels or clay jars, which represent people. Listen, there's somebody else hanging on the other side of your obedience, and the uncanny, ridiculous favor are coming to these peg ones, to come to these pegged aliacums. In other words, favor at the end of the day, y'all, it's not about status, it's about purpose. When you start seeing uncanny, ridiculous favor come over your life in this season, ask God, God, who is this for? What is my assignment? What is this all about? Because it's bigger than you in this season. It's bigger than you in this season. And so... From the least of vessels, the greater vessels, to the, from the bowls to the jars, the bowls represent the bowls of intercession. So the accumulated prayers of previous generations get downloaded on a generation that's pecked for God's glory. Isn't that powerful? Let me tell you how this happened in my little life. Now, Pastor Troy alluded to it in, in the, the, my introduction that he, that he gave me, which was pretty generous. <laughs> Remember to pay him next time I, I see him. <laughs> so those kind words. But in my family, uh, I, I shared this before with my friend Matt Lockett, how many of y'all were here when we came through, yeah. So in my family, I have this 200-year-old kettle pot that was used by the slaves in my family. It was passed down because they secretly used that pot in their prayer meetings to muffle their voices so the slave master wouldn't hear them praying. Passed down for many generations. And listen, I'm the product of those accumulated prayers from all those years ago. Because in the, it, the way the stories passed down to them, it was that they didn't think they would see, a, see freedom in their time, so they prayed for the freedom of their children and the next generation. So one day freedom comes, this young teenage girl, we don't know what her name is to this day, but she decided to keep that pot and that story in our family. And it was passed down to me after eight generations. And I've been taking it around the country to talk about what? The prayer bowls in heaven? Right? Revelation 5 and 8. So there are golden bowls in heaven full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And so um, I'm talking about that, but also talking about how it wasn't just black Christian slaves, but also white abolitionists and revivalists who prayed into being the first and the second great awakening. Had it not been for those revivals, slavery wouldn't have ended. But then I had this dream with Dr. King in it, where God dealt with me about my unforgiveness issues with racism that I experienced growing up. Shared with my friend Lou Engle, he said, hey, you have to share this at the Lincoln Memorial on MLK Celebration Day. Well, there was a white guy who was led to that same gathering because he had a dream. He had a dream about a man named Lou Engle, never met him before. 
looked him up on the internet and found out he was a real person. He freaked out. He showed up to that gathering. And we became friends. We've been friends for 18 years now. Well, fast forward. That friend of mine, Matt Lockett, he found out that the Civil War ended in his family's front yard. So we thought, man, what a cool coincidence. I have this pot where slaves pray for freedom. Yeah, this house where General Lee fought his last battle. What a cool coincidence. But then, y'all, here's the deal. We stumbled on more research, and we learned that it was his family who owned my family where the kettle pot came from. And we met at the Lincoln Memorial, both led by dreams, to the place where Dr. King said, I have a dream that one day the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood because the accumulated prayers of previous generations are being down on in generation pit for God's glory. And so the same way God would dealt with injustice back then, he started, he's dealing with injustice in our day, especially when it comes to the life issue. The, the, the moral dilemma of the day during that time, t- that time period was what? Slavery. And so authentic revival looked like the ending of slavery. I will submit to you that the litmus test for authentic revival today in our time will be the ending of abortion. Right? God's addressing this whole thing about identity and human dignity on the deepest levels because the deal is this. When the people that you cannot see can, can, can become optional, it's inevitable that other people that we can see can also be dehumanized and marginalized even to the place of, el- of, of elimination. Some people say black lives matter. I understand, you know, the emphasis. I can't get with the entity though. They buy too many houses. Some people say all lives matter. <laughs> I understand what they're trying to convey with all lives matter. But God is saying drill down deeper, life matters. <laughs> Amen. He's addressing this whole thing of human dignity on deep, deep levels. And I remember God had me actually praying into this. And uh, it was February, it was, well, I just, it was after a conference I had with Lou Engle, and we were praying. Matt Lockett and I actually met at a conference called Reverse the Decree of 73. <laughs> January 17, 2005, about a little less than a month later, um, the Supreme Court was actually going to hear a case from our friend Alan Parker who had uh, basically put a case before the court to try to reverse Roe v. Wade back in 2005. It was February 22nd. I thought it was, hey, it's, this is going to be the day. They decided that we're going to let people know if we're going to hear this case. So February 22nd, 2005, they decided we're not going to hear the case. And so I'm thinking, oh God, this is like a door being shut. This is so the devil. I cried myself to sleep that night. That's how much I cared about this issue and praying into it. I cried myself to sleep that night and all of a sudden I had a dream. In the dream, I was playing basketball against all the Supreme Court justices. <laughs> and babies and toddlers were my teammates. <laughs> and in the dream, they had on their black robes and they were just wearing us out. They were just shoo, shoo, so quick. We were getting blown out. For all you people who are not, you know, uh, uh, ballers, a blowout is when you, the other team is ahead like 20 or 30 points or more, and we were getting blown out big time, and in the dream I thought, man, I, I had no idea these old white people were so quick. <laughs> I mean, they were just blowing past me. <laughs> but in the dream I remember that I used to play college basketball. And then in the dream I started exerting myself a little bit, and there was a justice on the court that time named David Souter. He, he was on the left side of the court in the dream. I block his shot, and then a lady named Sandra Day O'Connor, who was on the court, started dribbling the ball back and forth in the middle of the court, and I take the ball from her, I rip her, and I go to the other end of the court, and I make a layup, and we were still lo- losing, but the momentum in the game began to shift. And then I woke up in the dream, and here's what I had heard the Lord say. Stay in the battle for the court with the babies. Remember who you are. You're part of the body of Christ. I'm raising up those who have blocked the shots of those on the left side of the court, and I'm taking the ball of abortion out of their hands, and the momentum in this game is about to change if you will continue to pray. That's what we prayed. I shared that dream with my friend Lou Engel at the time. We prayed that dream for two, three months, and guess what happened? All of a sudden, out of the blue, Sandra Day O'Connor took her name uh, basically turned in her resignation and came off the court. She was a centrist at that time who would go back and forth and kind of waffle on this issue. And all of a sudden, she turns in her name. 
to come off the court. William Wynn, Chris died. So all of a sudden, there's two vacancies on the court. So we're praying for, for the next, you know, justices that were supposed to be at court. God gave us one other person's name, literally by name. You have to pray for these people because when they get there, you, you have no idea just the influences that are vying for their decision making. We get the name of one of them. Nobody thought this person would ever make it on the court. Boom, he gets on the court. We had a dream about another person. They get on the court. Then uh, I could go through just a series of dreams, but just for the sake of time, let me show you this one that was so powerful. My friend Matt Lockett, who's been praying in front of that Supreme Court for 18 years, loved that man with duct tape on his mouth, with life written on it, praying in front of that court. One day he has a dream. This is like maybe five years ago. He dreams that uh, he's a Secret Service agent working for the CIA in the dream. CIA for us stands for Christian Intelligence Agency. <laughs> you keep praying, all of a sudden you get intel. But in the dream, he's, he, he's, he's working and he turns to someone in, in President Trump's administration and says to them, remember the name Amy Coney Barrett. Wakes up from the dream, we're like, who was Amy Coney Barrett? You know who she was. Looked up and found out she was this daughter of the charismatic renewal that swept through a lot of the, the Catholic church at the time and uh, had seven children, two of them African-American and was pro-life. So we, we started praying for her. And then his last appointment, President Trump remembers Amy Coney Barrett. God gave us a name of at least three, four justices by name through dreams to pray for. Prayed off the other ones, kept this, and then all of a sudden, on, what is it, June 24th, what happens? Roe v. Wade gets overturned. And Samuel Alito, who we prayed on the court, writes the decision. Amy Cordy Barrett comes on. This whole thing begins to shift because the accumulated prayers of previous generations can download it on a generation pegged for God's glory. June 24th was also the same day that slavery first ended by, through legislation in Great Britain. God's putting his finger on this thing, right? They announced it at 1010. What is John 1010? The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I come to give you life and life more abundantly. I think God is speaking through these set of events. So that's what, was, that's, that's what I see that happened. And this year, the 222 year, this was the year of the key. This was the year of the open door. But now this is the year where we get open that door and we're gonna sit at a table. I believe we're moving from 20, 20, uh, 2022 being about the year of the open door and shutting the door what the enemy wanted to do to move it into a Psalm 23 year in the midst of great crisis God is creating a table he's creating a table and you know in Psalm 23 where he says that thou hast prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies right and uh, I, I love this, uh, <laughs> this, this this younger generation because they're always like hey look at me now you thought I wasn't going to make it but look at me now and a lot of the preachers are like that you know <laughs> He didn't think he was going to do it, but look what God did, you know. But this ain't that season. We're not going to be saying, look at me now. We're going to say, what can we do together now? He's going to sit us at the table. With the, we're going to see reconciliation be released in ways we've never seen before. Powerful, powerful ways. And we're going to see the glory of God being released in power, power, powerful, powerful ways. I had a dream last night. I believe this dream is for the church. I had a specific pastor. I, had, I told him about this dream. But here's the dream. In the dream, we were all sitting at a table. I had this yesterday. So I feel like it's hot off the press. So <laughs> the dream had to be for open door. <laughs> in the dream, we were in a small room. It's kind of like the upper room. And we're just talking, and this one leader, his back was against the wall, he was sitting on the floor, and we were sitting at a table, but the table was so low, there were no seats in the room. The floor was a seat. And the only way to sit at the table was to sit on the floor. So we're all sitting on the floor, and this young person came in and started talking about their hunger for God. And all of a sudden, my, my cell phone cracked. The face of it cracked, and it broke, and it just crumbled in my hands. And uh, 
I showed it to everybody. I said, what's, what's, what's happening here? And I just began sobbing and weeping. The presence of God filled the room. I began to weep and sob so uncontrollably. I thought, you know, I mean, I'm kind of embarrassed crying like this in front of them. And then I realized it broke out in the whole room. The love of God, a baptism of the love of God fell into that room so powerfully, right? And that, that was basically the gist of the dream. A uh, mighty Russian wind came in through the room. But the thing that impacted us the most was we couldn't, one, not, we could not not pray. And the other thing that impacted us was the presence and the love of God was so powerful in the room. So that's what I dreamt last night. I think that's going to happen here, open church. There's a table of leadership that's being prepared for people here. But here's the deal. It's not, <laughs> the seats at the table is not for those who are looking for seats. The way that you get into this leadership room is to humble yourself. You're going to have to get on the floor to sit at this table. You're going to have to humble yourself to get at this table. And hunger and intimacy with God is what's going to get you into the room, is what's going to get you to the table. But for those who are hungry in this season, you're going to, you're, you're going to encounter the presence of God like you've never seen before. I know we, some of us lived through the 90s and the power time, time of renewal. What I felt last night and saw last night, I woke up in tears. Something is going on. I think God wants to release through this church. So you're moving from, yeah, you've opened the door, but now you can move to the table with greater levels of intimacy with God and each other. Amen. So stand to your feet. <laughs> I know it's kind of an unusual message, but this is the word I feel, this is the word of the Lord for this house. Keys of authority, keys of intimacy for a season of refreshing. And it's interesting, this whole thing that happened with Elijah, can you study that? Go read in Isaiah 36. This was a time period of one of the greatest uh, a crisis in Israel. That's when Eliakim got gets promoted. They were actually sieged around for two years by the Assyrians. Nothing could go in, nothing could go out. They were quarantined for two years. Anybody being, know what a quarantine is like? <laughs> yeah. That's when he got his promotion. Elijah got his promotion during that time period. But God sent one angel and wiped out 185,000 Assyrians in one night. Because when God's people got in the right alignment for the kingdom assignment, boom, the enemy was taken out. Listen, you've been promoted. You've been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. Some of you have been called. Some of you are those mama bears that are showing up at the school board meetings that are like, you know, my, my wife, when well, she was preaching on this one time, she was talking about, God was saying, hey, it's time to wake up, it's time to wake up, it's time to wake up. That's what God is doing to the Eliakos right now. He's waking us all up. Look what they're trying to do in the school board. So look at trying to get puberty blockers to our kids. Look what they're trying to do over here. And look what's happening here with sex trafficking and happening here. And look how they're trying to put up Krampus on Christmas tree in Fort Worth, Texas. Stuff like that. Oops, did I say that? Yeah. But God has to raise somebody up to shut the door to what the enemy is trying to do, open a door to God's kingdom of influence coming in. So you hear and you, you know like, okay, this word is for me, especially if you've been seeing the twos all over the place. Come up here, I wanna pray for you. Yeah, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, oh, I saw it over you the whole time. God bless you, sweetheart. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the midst of great crisis, one, God reminds us of our calling, but then two, he says, this is the hour you've been born for. Especially the mama bears, the papa bears, for a generation bound by an orphan spirit. He's raising up the awakeners. So, Father, right now in Jesus' name, just put your hands and receive them all right now. Father, I thank you. New keys for this new season in the name of Jesus. I break off of you hope deferred that it made your heart sick for whatever reason. I break off the plan of the enemy where he's trying to shut you down, try to put a muzzle over your mouth. I break the power of that muzzle that he's trying to place over your mouth, whether it's on social media, whether it's on your job. I say they can't cancel the call that's on your life. 
because the Lord has need of you. So, Father, I thank you for a fresh infilling of your spirit in this season. In Jesus' name. Bless the Lord. Come on, let's all, let's worship for a little bit. That uh, pastor.